Welcome to Live Longer World, a podcast where we unite to boost longevity and fight aging. All resources and premium member benefits are found at livelongerworld.com. Now, on to today's episode. Today's guest is Dr. Peter Adams, who is an expert in the biology of aging and cancer. In today's episode, you will learn about cellular senescence and its dual role in protecting against cancer but also causing tissue aging. You'll also hear about the role of senolytic drugs to protect against age-associated cellular senescence and the connection between the mitochondria and cellular senescence. And finally, you'll hear about the development theory of aging, the fact that aging might begin in the womb itself. With that, I hope you enjoy the conversation today. Hi, Dr. Adams, and welcome to the Live Longer World podcast. Hi, happy to be here, Asta. Thanks. Watched a lot of your videos. I really like them. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, So, Dr. Adams, your work focuses a lot on the epigenetics of cellular senescence, cancer, and aging. Uh, Maybe we can begin by you explaining what is cellular senescence, because that's something that's been implicated in aging a bunch of times it keeps coming up um so if you can explain what it is and also perhaps the dual role it plays because it has a positive function but then over time with age it starts becoming more negative so yeah yeah so i guess i mean cellular senescence was first described by uh leonard hayflick and paul moorhead back in the the 1960s as really a you know, a, a, a tissue culture phenomenon. They were growing uh, normal human um, fibroblasts, primary fibroblasts, we call them, in, in a dish. And, uh, you know, what they noticed was that after a certain number of population doublings, about, about six, 60 population doublings, these cells would just, you know, just, just stop growing. Um, and they acquired this, you know, large, flat, kind of vacuolated phenotype as well um so and so they call this you know this basically this proliferation arrest as as cellular senescence and at the time i think it was quite unusual because at the time most people were working with um with cancer cells in in culture and cancer cells you know the thing about cancer cells is they will you know they will basically grow forever they're they're so-called immortal um, so this this proliferation arrest on the part of these these normal primary human cells was was quite unusual, um, and I think even then, you know, Leonard um, kind of noted at the time that you know this this proliferation arrest, this kind of you know limit on on proliferative capacity, might um, might be something which you know works as you know an anti cancer mechanism. Okay, so it would it would stop. Uh, potential cancer cells from proliferating uncontrollably, um, and I think he also noted that it might also, you know, put a, a limit on on tissue regeneration and therefore lead to lead to tissue aging. Okay, so <clears throat> two, you know, really insightful observ- um, you know observations uh, or, or predictions because I think now there's you know there's there's very good evidence for 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 both of those. Um, you know, I, I think for a long time, um, you know, senescence remained as, as, a, as a tissue culture phenomenon. And I think probably in, back in the 1990s, there was a lot of debate as to whether it was, you know, physiologically relevant um, or whether it was just a, a tissue culture artifact. Um, you know, something that I think happened at about you know the, the 1990s and the early 2000s, 2000s was that you know I think you know primarily Judy Cam- Campisi and I think you know followed by uh, Daniel Paper and Hazel Skill showed that you know senescent cells also have this this secreted inflammatory phenotype okay which mm-hmm. Judy called the the senescence associated secretory phenotype so this is a a an inflammatory phenotype whereby these the senescent cells will secrete you know a lot of different um site inflammatory cytokines and chemokines and, and other things so therefore they have the potential to, to 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 you know to interact with their neighbors and also to regulate the immune system okay so when i think about senescence i think as you know primarily of, of two 
two phenotypes, okay? There's this proliferation arrest, whereby the cells stop growing, um, but then there's, um, and then there's also this, this inflammatory phenotype, or, or the SAS, senescence-associated secretory phenotype. Um, but even at that point, I mean, there was still debate as to whether senescence, you know, was something which, you know, happened in vivo physiologically, or whether, it, you know, was it still this, just this tissue culture artifact. But for me, you know, the big, the big change came, I think, in about 2005, when there was a, a flurry of papers showing that senescence could be observed in vivo, uh, mm. in, in both humans and mice, and particularly in the context of, um, you know, oncogene, um, oncogene activation. Okay, um, so it was shown that in these in these particular circumstances, you know, with in cells with activated oncogenes, that uh, senescent cells can can accumulate in in vivo. Um, so actually, one of the, the best examples of, of that is these, uh, you know, basically, you know, molds, benign human nevi. Okay, which I think we all I'm not sure if I have one handy to show, but but you know, we all we all have have moles. Okay. And what moles are, are thought to be is that in the black, brown pigment comes from the, the senescent melanocyte, the senescent cells. Okay, they're actually melanocytes, which is why they are they are brown. And and the reason that they are senescent is because they contain an activated oncogene. And so this oncogene causes a proliferative expansion, but eventually mm -hmm. the cells will arrest to form this this cluster of, of cells, of, of senescent cells or or senescent melanocytes. Okay, so that was one of the, the best demonstrations of um, you know senescent cells in, or it's still kind of the paradigm for senescent cells in vivo in in humans. I think. Um, so then, you know, at that point, we kind of knew we we kind of characterized the phenotype proliferation arrest and SASP. We knew that senescent cells um, occur are found in in vivo. Um, and since then, I would say that there's there's a lot of you know there's, there's a lot of you know fantastic work being being done by by many labs, both you know defining the role of of senescence uh, in you know as Leonard pre predicted, okay, in both prevention of of cancer, but also as a as a as a driver of 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 aging. Um, you know, I've mentioned. I mean, in terms of the, the things that cause senescence, like I, I said that Leonard initially, you know, noticed it just through, you know, growing cells in, in culture. I've also mentioned that, you know, senescence can be caused by activated oncogenes and, for example, in, in human, human nevi. Okay, so, so actually there are thought to be, you know, various different triggers of senescence. One is, so that the, what, what Leonard was, was observing was partly... The, the, the trigger there was was in large part shortening of telomeres. Okay, so as the cells were growing in culture, the telomeres are getting shorter, and eventually the telomeres get so short as to activate a, a DNA damage response, and that induced senescence. Uh, in the case of oncogenes that I mentioned, I mean oncogenes. So an oncogene is is a you know a mutated gene which has the capability to promote cancer. Um, and so, you know, cancers are characterized by, by having these, these activated oncogenes. But what happens is if a cell acquires, and this is the case in, in melanocytes within nevi, okay, if a cell acquires just a single oncogene, okay, then it's actually pretty good at protecting itself from that. And so what will happen is that the cell will sense this activated oncogene and, and it, eventually it will stop growing and enter this senescent state. Okay, and the reason oncogenes do that is, is again thought to be in part because they cause DNA damage. Um, and then there's other types of DNA damage and other cell stresses which can also cause senescence. So, so we know that, you know, senescence is caused by these various different molecular triggers often associated with DNA damage that causes senescence. Senescence is associated with these two key phenotypes, the proliferation arrest and, and the inflammation. And, and we know that occurs in vivo, and as I say, we know that it, it, on the one hand, it prevents cancer, that's what it's doing in, in nevi, um, but on the other hand, you know, we also now know that it promotes tissue aging. Um, 
And so in, you know, in more recent years, there's been a lot of, um, a lot of work done on the, you know, the aging side of things. Okay. So for example, mouse models have been generated, um, for example, by Jan van Dersen and Darren Baker and Judy Cambese. And these are mouse models where you can actually, um, use sophisticated genetic strategies to eliminate senescent cells from a tissue. Okay, and what's been shown that when you do that, when you get rid of senescent cells from the tissue of a mouse, then it can promote healthy aging of those tissues, and it can even promote, um, you know, extended lifespan and, and health span of, of the mice. And, you know, not only now can that be done, you know, using these sophisticated genetic strategies, but it can also be done with, with drugs. Mm -hmm. Okay, these are these so-called senolytic drugs. Um, and, you know, the, a number of these drugs have also been shown to improve, um, you know, health span and, 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 and lifespan of mice and, and suppress specific pathologies of, of aging. Okay, so, so that's why, you know, there's a lot of excitement in the senescence field now about actually, you know, targeting senescent cells in, in, in human tissues for the benefit of, um, you know, preventing specific pathologies of aging, perhaps promoting healthy aging and, and, you know, if you, if, if you believe this is a good thing, actually extending lifespan, okay? Um, it's, a, it's a different issue. I, I'm, more of, I'm more in the camp that what we need to do here is, is to extend healthy human lifespan and not necessarily extend overall lifespan. But, but you know, whichever camp you're in, there's, there's, you know, there is quite a bit of excitement about senolytics in, in that regard. And, and, there are, and some of these molecules are now being, you know, dysatinib and, and quercetin, for example, is is one combination senolytic, which is, you know, I mean, these are essentially, you know, they're either natural compounds or compounds which have been ex extensively tested in, in humans. And so, you know, it's relatively easy to, to test them in, in the clinic against specific pathologies. I think like, you know, chronic kidney disease, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis and osteoarthritis, for example, uh, are some of the conditions that these uh, drugs are being tested against, and there's there's some, yeah. You know, it's very it's very early days. Um, I, mean, no, no, I wouldn't say that you know full data is actually in, but there's some encouraging preliminary data. Fantastic. I'm going to come back to analytics and ask you a few questions on that. I think there were a few listeners who had questions on that. Uh, but before that, on the point of mole, so I have a mole right here. Yeah. Is yeah. that is that like an oncogene suppression? What what is that then? Yeah, so I've that had it since I was young. Right. Yes. So the you know the kind of the conventional view of that would be that um, that you know the, the the melanocytes within that mole, they that most of them, well, actually all of them will con contain either a you know typically one of two oncogenes. Okay, it's either an activated BRAF oncogene or an activated RAS oncogene. Okay, these are two oncogenes which are actually in the same pathway. BRAF activates RAS. Okay, so it kind of drives this signaling pathway, which can promote cell proliferation. But if you get uh, if you get too much of it, it can actually promote cancer. Okay, mm -hmm. so so those melanocytes would have an activated BRAF or um, or NRAS oncogene. Um, you you can't tell and take unless you take the DNA out and sequence it. You can't really tell, but it have they'll probably have one of those two, and then but. Because of that oncogene induced senescence, these cells are actually in this, you know, now in this kind of stable proliferation arrest. And, you know, they'll probably be like that for the, you know, for the rest of your, your life. Okay. Um, I mean, occasionally moles can, you know, they can progress to, to melanoma. So, which is why, you know, if you, you know, if you have a mole and you see a change in shape or a change in size or it gets inflamed or whatever, you should definitely go and see a doctor and typically they'll just, they'll just remove it and it's not a problem. Um, oh. so, so yeah, they, they, they are, they are senescent melanocytes in that mold. Um, we, you know, we've, that's the, that's the dogma. Okay. We've actually published a few papers in my lab suggesting we, we're not sure it's totally that quite that simple. Okay. We actually don't, we, in my lab, we don't necessarily see melanocytes within a nevus as being, bona fide senescence, but actually more of a kind of an aberrant form of senescence. We actually think that the reason they expand 
to the point that they do so that you can actually see them is because the senescence program is somewhat impaired. Okay, so they actually get to proliferate to a point where you can see them. And actually, mm -hmm. the, the reason we think that they are that the, the, the senescence program is impaired is actually related to the, an interesting biology of moles, which is that actually most of them, most people are actually born with their moles right. or they are acquired during early development in, in young children. Okay, so we think that there is a developmental um, component to it as well through what's known as um, activated wind signaling, which is basically a growth factor pathway. And so that, which is, that is quite active during early development of, of melanocytes. And so we think that that is, you know, helping to slow down the senescence program, which is why these moles get to be as, as, as big as they do. Okay. And there's a few other kind of, you know, funny quirks about them. They're, they're really interesting things. Um, um, but yeah, I mean, the, the, I, I, I mean, I didn't realize until I had two daughters that how, you know, noticeable it is that, you know, moles are basically, you know, acquired, you know, as I say, born with them or they're acquired in, in young children. I, mean, I remember my first daughter when she was born, I think she had one. Okay, because I was working on moles at the time, so I counted it, it was just one. <laughs> but, you know, now she has, has dozens, okay? And so these all grew during childhood and, and adolescence. But, you know, generally adults don't acquire more, more moles. I think it's pretty, pretty rare, okay? Once, once we reach adulthood, we, we kind of have our, uh, you know, complement of moles, I think. But then for people who have moles, uh, should they be worried that, those senescent cells in that area could be releasing SASP that you just spoke about or the secretory phenotype. Yes, you know, so that's, an, that's another quirk of, of moles is that, you know, I mean, they don't really, you know, as, as a, you know, one view of senescence is that the SASP, and there is evidence for this from, you know, mouse models, okay, that, that, that the SASP will promote clearance of senescent cells by the immune system, mm. okay? But that, you know, that very rarely happens with, with moles. Okay, and moles don't see, I don't think uh, moles have much of a SASP. Um, so, so that is, in my mind, another reason why, is, you know, why, you know, the, the, the melanocytes within a nevus are a little bit aberrant and probably aren't really, you know, a, a bona fide senescence. Um, but then even, you know, even talking about bona fide senescence gets kind of problematic, okay, because as you probably know, there isn't really, I mean, there isn't an accepted single definition of a senescent cell, okay, it's really kind of a, a spectrum of phenotypes. So I think, you know, the, the melanocytes within a nevus are, are on that spectrum, but they're a little bit of a, a variation of it compared to, you know, other senescent cells which have a proliferation arrest and a, and a SASP. Um, and the, the other thing, you know, the other thing that varies is that, I mean, it used to be thought that senescence is something which just happens to proliferating cells, okay, and that's something that came out of uh, Leonard Hayflick's work, and he was studying proliferating cells in culture, so for a long time thought people thought, well, you know, senescence is just something that happens to proliferating cells. But now I think there's a lot of evidence from, um, you know, that, that non-proliferating cells, for example, including neurons and cardiomyocytes, uh, and even, you know, melanocytes in, in normal human skin, which are typically, you know, non-proliferating, that these non-proliferating cells can also acquire a, a senescent-like phenotype, okay? Mm -hmm. So in that case, what happens is they, they don't stop proliferating because they're not proliferating in the first place, but they will acquire the inflammatory phenotype. And then, and that can be, you know, that then can drive the, the chronic inflammation which is associated with senescence. Um, I see. And yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, that's quite an interesting point. Yeah, I guess what I didn't say is, I didn't comment much about how, I mean, how, how senescent cells are thought to promote aging. Um, and the, I think, you know, part of it is probably, for example, the proliferation arrest that can, you know, prevent cell cell renewal and tissue regeneration the inflammatory phenotype drives chronic can drive, can drive chronic inflammation or so-called inflammaging um, and there's also evidence that you know the senescent state will also prevent the normal differentiation of progenitor cells okay so there's probably a bunch of ways that that senescent cells can contribute to to tissue 
aging by preventing proliferation, promoting inflammation, and, and preventing you know normal differentiation. Okay, yeah. So, so you mentioned senolytics then, which is helpful in clearing away the senescent cells, and you know could be quite promising in increasing maybe health span at least. Um, and you mentioned a few of them, like quercetin. So, I guess what is your take on on senolytics? I know some of the concerns are what age should you be taking them or what's the right dosage or are they really just targeting senescent cells or uh, would they be targeting potentially good cells as well? So what's your view on senolytics so far? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think, I mean, all of those are, are really complex questions. Um, you know, there's probably people who could give you more informed answers than me. Um, you know, I guess I, I would say that, though, that really, you know, we're not going to have answers to all those questions about, um, you know, specificity for normal cells versus senescent cells and good and bad consequences of removing senescent cells, etc. You know, it's going to take a long time to get answers to all of those questions. And I think, you know, I think instead, you know, probably the, the approach that's being taken is just to be you know, kind of empirical about it, okay, let's just test these, you know, these senolytics. I think, you know, at the moment we're testing drugs which have already been extensively tested in humans. We know their toxicity profile and they are being tested against, you know, specific pathologies of aging, okay? We're not giving them to a bunch of, you know, 40 or 50 year old very healthy people and saying, well, you know, take this for the next 20 or 30 years, okay? They're being tested against specific pathologies, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, osteoarthritis, etc. You know, I, I think presumably, and you know, under, you know, well controlled, um, as in, you know, close observation, um, circumstances, you know, limit, limited doses, limited durations, etc. And let's just see if they are of benefit to these specific pathologies of aging, which are already, you know, detrimental pathologies in their own right. And then, you know, before, and then if, if, if the results from those studies are, are encouraging, then we can, you know, we can move on to other things. But so I, I think, you know, I think everybody agrees that it's, we, you know, we're not, I, well, at least everybody who I know who kind of works on senescent cells, I, I don't think, I don't think anyone really advocate, advocates that you know, healthy middle-aged people should be taking senolytics. Right. I ask because, you know, there are so many experimenters out there and yeah, people yeah. don't want to wait for years and years yeah. for some of these yeah. studies to come out. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, when they're like in their 50s, decently healthy, of course, but of course you're not nowhere as close to where you were when you were in your 20s and yeah. you you want to test some of these so I, I think in fact this question came from one of my listeners who was wondering well is it bad to be taking too much of it and too often and i think he's just like a healthy middle-aged person so yeah and I, I think people are experimenting with it as well so it's like for for those who are what do you think they should be wary about at least well i i think you know the 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 potential long term consequences, the potential issues of um, you know not getting not not taking the right dose. Okay, I mean most things in biology are very you know dose dependent. You know typically things you know have this you know things will often have this this kind of shape. Okay, you know they 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 may get better up to a certain dose. You get an optimum, and then things start to become detrimental. Okay. Um, and that's the case for a lot of things in, in biology. Okay. So, um, you know, I, I don't know that we really know what that optimum dose is for, for most of these things. Um, and, uh, you know, the, 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 the extrapolations from, you know, from mice, uh, obviously, you know, uh, the extrapolations that we can make from, from mice are, are, are limited. So, you know, I, I think I think for some of these things, um, you know, I mean, I, my understanding is that I mean that you know some of these candidate candidate interventions, there is good human data on you know toxicity profiles, dose responses, etc. So I think for some of these things, if you know if you're kind of well informed and you can interpret that data, you can probably um, 
you know, make an educate, you know, make a good and informed decision. I, I, I haven't looked into any of that that data. Okay, it's not something that I, I mean, I, I don't take anything. Yeah, yeah. No, it's 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 always very interesting because when I talk to scientists, most of them, in fact, are not really taking any of these supplements. And then there's this whole uh, group of consumers out there who are just so eager to start taking a lot of these supplements. And I, I still say it's like, yeah, I mean, the, a lot of the data is not out there. So if you're taking them, it's kind of based on your own risk and based on what you've studied uh, from the limited studies that are there. Yeah. yeah. So... Um, I want to talk a bit about uh, some of your, your your work on liver cancer, actually, or, or oh, yeah. you've just started some of the work. I know yeah, you recently yeah. got a grant for that, so congrats on that uh, um, from the NIH. Yeah. Um, so, and, 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 and that's to study liver cancer and aging more yeah. specifically. To start, I guess I'm curious, why did you pick liver cancer? Yeah, good. That's a good question. Um, I mean, it, 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 I guess it's a little bit, pragmatic um i mean if i guess partly because you know when we when we want to study cancer and and i, I mean the way the way that cancer is is typically studied okay in mouse models is using uh genetically modified mice um so mice which you know have been engineered to have specific oncogenes or to inactivate specific tumor suppressors mm -hmm. okay um, and, and typically what's done is that the, you know, these mice are generated and then when the mice are still young, these oncogenes and, and tumor suppressors are, are switched, you know, on or off. Okay. And typically then the mouse gets cancer pretty quickly. Okay. Often in, you know, in, in, in weeks or, or months. Okay. So, so, you know, so this completely ignores the, the role of, of aging. In, in the, the kind of genesis of, of, of the disease. Um, and yet, you know, for, for most adult human cancers, age is the biggest single risk factor. Okay, so what we wanted to do was specifically look at, well, what's, what's the role of aging in, in development of cancer? You know, why is it that, you know, most cancers increase with, with age and, you know, very common in old people and, and most cancers are very rare in young people with, with some exceptions, okay? I mean, there are some childhood leukemias things like retinoblastoma, et cetera, which tend to, you know, hit young people. But, you know, these are kind of, in my mind, fundamentally different types of disease, okay? So most of the common human cancers, colon cancer, breast cancer, uh, prostate cancer, lung cancer, liver cancer, these are, these are, you know, cancers of older people. So that, so that was what we wanted to model. Um, the trouble is that if you take the, you know, the typical genetically, the typical genetically modified mice, then you generate these mice and then you've got your mice, but now you have to wait two years for them to get old before you can, you know, switch on the oncogenes to actually do the experiment. Okay. So, so, you know, we, you know, like everybody else, we don't really want to do that. It's very, it's, it's, it's very time consuming and costly. Okay. So the strategy that we wanted to take was to take, um, you know, young and old mice, young and old wild type mice, Okay, and getting old wild type mice is relatively straightforward. Okay, we actually have a colony ourselves, or we can get them from from the NIA for for free because we have NIA grants. So we can get these young and old mice, and then but these are wild type mice. Okay, they don't have any of these oncogenes or tumor suppressors engineered into their genome. But what we can now do is we we use viruses to deliver the the oncogenes or the tumor suppressors to the young mice and the wild type mice and we compare the effects of well what happens if we you know deliver an oncogene to a young mouse versus a, a wild a, an old mouse okay so that's a, a, a big part of the approach that we're trying and it and it's you know it's, it's you know generating some very interesting results but you know going back to your question of well why liver cancer okay so the liver is quite easy to manipulate in that way Okay, so it's, it's quite easy to, to, to deliver viruses to a mouse and, and you know, in, and, and put these oncogenes into the liver. Um, it's much easier to do it in the liver than it is, for example, in some other tissues like the, you know, pancreas or, or even, you know, in, well, many tissues. Um, we have some models, we're doing similar experiments with the mouse mammary gland as well as a model for breast cancer, but 
but the, the challenge is the, the, the virus delivery strategies there are a bit more more tricky so so that was a bit part of that was part of it okay just that it's um it's uh you know it, it was kind of you know it was it was a, a, a tractable model that we could we could manipulate um you know the, i mean there's some other advantage i mean the liver is relatively uh homogeneous in terms of cell types okay it's it's about 80 percent hepatocytes so you can get a relatively pure population of cells okay we, we purify the hepatocytes from the liver so we know we know what cells that we we deal, we're dealing with okay as opposed to dealing with the complexities of a whole tissue okay so that's another advantage and it, and it just turns out that you know the progression of liver cancer is also very interesting okay i mean it starts off with you know perhaps a, a steatotic or, or a fatty liver okay that then might become inflamed um in you know non-alcoholic st steatohepatitis and then you get fibrosis and, and cirrhosis and so this kind of progression through kind of metabolic changes inflammatory changes mm. um it's kind of a very interesting um, disease progression, um, which we, which we wanted and we wanted to understand more about that. But you know, to be honest with you, a, bi a big part of it was just the practicalities um, of of working with the liver over some other tissues. Absolutely, yeah. So w one of the statements actually um, that I think stood out to me was that liver cancer rates in the United States are lower than the rest of the world. Um, I'm just curious. Do you know why that's the case? Yeah, I mean, a lot of that's due to, um, I mean, in, in some parts of the world, it, it's a lot higher due to um, H, uh, H, HCV, uh, so hepatitis virus. Um, okay. that, that's a lot higher in 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 other, you know, some other parts of the world than than in the US. But but it's a big concern in the US because you know in 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 the US. Uh, you know, I mean, two of the major risk factors for, for liver cancer are age, obviously, as I've mentioned, but but also obesity. Mm -hmm. OK, and so as, you know, populations get older and, and fatter, um, basically, you know, li li rates of liver cancer are, are projected to increase dramatically. And, and still, you know, the, the, the cure rates for liver cancer are not good. So so, you know, it's it's not one of the biggest killers at the moment but certainly it's um it, you know it's definitely definitely on the rise and it's projected to be a big problem yeah yeah especially i mean with with uh, poor diets it also yeah. leads to yeah. non-alcoholic fatty liver uh, diseases right. Right. right right so one of your hypotheses is that you know you'll be working on something called the interferon signaling which yeah. is um which is a natural part of the immune system uh, yeah. you mentioned uh maybe you can talk about what is this the signaling pathway and like what is its connection with the immune system and i guess something that it's going awry with age so what's going wrong with age yeah so so i mean i guess the interferon pathway is you know best known as as being uh you know a, a pathway that that responds to to, to virus infection okay and and also you know other kind of you know related types of uh you know other types of, of molecular damage okay um these you know in particular viruses and and you know for, foreign foreign nucleic acids foreign dnas in the cell they can they can activate uh you, you know the interferon pathways um you know it's i mean in terms of of cancer it's you know it's, it's better Best known, I think, as you know, being being tumor suppressive. Okay, so it's thought to, to recruit immune cells, which can um, eliminate um, potential cancer cells. Okay, but 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 there is but what we've noticed in in the old liver is that there is this you know what appears to be a, a kind of chronic activation of 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 it, a chronic low level activation of of interferon signaling. And, you know, there is some evidence that a chronic low level act, uh, activation of interferon signaling can, can actually, you know, switch from being a, a beneficial thing to actually being detrimental. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the, I mean, kind of what I was saying earlier about, you know, the doses of senolytics and other drugs. Okay. They might, they might be good, but, 
but at certain doses or on you know long-term treatment they might switch to being bad okay because everything in everything in biology is kind of you know very very finely balanced okay and if you tip things you know too far one direction it can go from being beneficial to detrimental and that seems to be the case with chronic interferon signaling okay is that you know this this chronic interferon signaling which which we appears to accumulate with aging can actually instead of activating the immune system can 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 then actually dampen the immune system okay and it, it perhaps does that because um you know the, the, there's only so much immune activation that, that, that the body wants, okay, and, and it eventually maybe that's sensed as being, you know, a, a chronic activation is sensed as being a bad thing. So, so, so then, you know, the, the system kind of, you know, puts itself into reverse, okay, and so instead of being immune activating and getting rid of potential cancer cells, it can actually... Um, do the opposite, okay, and prevent the immune system from eliminating cancer, potential cancer cells. And so that's that's one hypothesis that we have in the, in the old liver, okay, is that this chronic low level activation of interferon signaling um, will will dampen down the immune system, leading to so called immune suppression, and that allows you know these potential cancer cells. They're not cancer cells yet, okay, they're, but they're potential cancer cells which might otherwise be immune removed by the immune system it allows those cells to you know to persist and um and you know and then and then you know increase therefore increase the risk of cancer in the old tissue mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so one other hypothesis you have is studying the mitochondria and I think you've already studied a lot of this with your work that showing the connection between mitochondrial dysfunction and um, increase in SASP maybe. So what is the connection between mitochondria and cellular senescence? Um, right, so, so what we've, so we know that in, in you know, in senescent cells, the, the you know, the mitochondria are, are, are dysfunctional. Okay, so they have, you know, they have abnormal mor morphology, and if we look at kind of, you know, various bioenergetic bio bio parameters of of mitochondria, in you know, in in senescent cells, it you know, it doesn't look as if they are, you know, functioning efficiently or, or properly, um, and that you know, that's that's been known for for quite a while. Um, I guess the, the the surprise was to us was that you know this this that this this these dysfunctional mitochondria might actually be you know promoting uh, aspects of the senescent phenotype so so you know one way of looking at it but initially might be that well yeah okay the mitochondria dysfunctional that's just you know that's just a consequence of senescence okay but in actual fact we think in some respects it's the opposite okay the dysfunctional mitochondria are actually sending a signal into the nucleus of the cell, and and the, and, the, and the mitochondria are actually telling the nucleus what to do, okay? And that's, you know, that's kind of the opposite for how we, you know, we think about a lot of things in biology. We normally think that, the, the you know, high school, we're taught that, you know, that the nucleus is kind of a control center of the cell, and the nucleus tells everything else what to do. But I think what's becoming apparent is, and this isn't just mitochondria and senescence, I think it's all organelles in, you know, many different biological contexts, but you know, there's, there's, it's much more of a two-way communication, okay? But, you know, what we found in, in senescent cells is that the mito these, these mitochondria are signaling to, sending a signal to the nucleus, and what that then does is it causes the nucleus to eject, um, you know, bits of DNA into, into the cytoplasm of the cell. Um, and... Uh, and then that, that, that cytoplasm, in, that DNA in the cytoplasm, okay, then, then that's, you know, that's somewhat reminiscent of a, of a virus, okay? I mentioned, um, you know, you know and, and, and as I mentioned earlier, you know, viruses can be sensed by the interferon pathway, okay? Mm -hmm. So then we think there's, there's this whole connection going from mitochondria seg sending a signal to the nucleus, uh, expelling bits of DNA into the cytoplasm, activating the interferon pathway and other inflammatory pathways and 
and you know potentially all this immune suppression that I just just mentioned to you. So so you know by that view, these these mitochondria are really kind of central um, controllers of the of the senescent phenotype. In, you know, an inflammatory phenotype. They're not just kind of you know passive bystanders. Interesting. So in terms of therapies, then maybe targeting the mitochondria could also help with yeah um, with yeah. senescent cell clearing. Yeah. Yeah, so we've, you know, we've, as kind of proof of principle, we've identified, you know, a number of small molecules which will inhibit, you know, components of this pathway, including, you know, acting, we think, at the mitochondria, and we're actively screening for, you know, other drugs which will, which will also do this and intervene, you know, in this pathway or improve mitochondria function and therefore suppress the inflammatory phenotype of senescent cells, which, as I've said to you, can be you know, damaging in various different ways. What, yeah. what are some of the molecules of what you've already found? So at the moment, they're, you know, they're kind of, well, most of them, um, we've, we've published, for example, with uh, so-called junk inhibitors, uh, inhibitors of a specific signaling kinase, <clears throat> HDAC inhibitors, which affect, you know, nuclear uh, chromatin, um, and then also some in inhibitors of, of uh, you know, DNA, DNA repair pathways. So all of these different types of inhibitor. I mean, these, we found these through kind of hypothesis-driven approaches, but we, we, you know, we're now doing unbiased screens to find, try and find you know, novel drugs, including you know, things which, you know, for example, natural compounds, which would be um, you know, easier to ad administer to, you know, to to humans for, as candidate healthy, healthy aging interventions, you know, like, like, like quercetin, for example. Right. Yeah. No, I look forward to that. I, in, in terms of natural compounds, I guess, then for the mitochondria specifically, um, are you aware if some of, some of the mitochondria ones like your lithium A or CoQ10, um, if, they, if, if, if they actually help in terms of clearing away senescent cells too? No, we, we keep, that's a really good idea, and we, you know, we keep exchange. I've exchanged a bunch of emails with, um, you know, we, we keep talking about that in in the lab to test some of these, you know, specific compounds, and we haven't we haven't got round to doing it yet. I think what we should do is we should, you know, we should incorporate, you know, get a library of these things together and and put them into the into the the, the screens that we're that we we're, we're doing. Because you're right, there's some interest. There's some certainly some kind of interesting, you know, candidate molecules out there as well. Right. I'm, I'm always yeah. so intrigued by how biology is so interrelated. Oh, yeah. One thing ends up affecting multiple yeah. different things. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, yeah, I mean, that's the, the wonder and the complexity of, of biology. Yeah, it's just amazing. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so maybe going a little more technical for a bit. Um, I know you've coined this term chromostatus, which I guess more high level basically means epigenetic stability. Yeah. Um, and, and, and you talk about how, you know, the stable epigenome uh, suppresses cancer and suppresses aging. But I guess over time it becomes unstable. Or maybe if you can talk to the relationship between <clears throat> um, loss and stability of the epigenome and um, aging. Yeah, I mean, it, it kind of basically comes from the idea that, you know, the epigenome or, or, or chromatin, okay, is not, is not fixed. Um, you know, we typically think of, of DNA sequence, you know, AGCT as, as being, you know, that that sequence is fixed, okay, apart from, you know, mutations and other, other types of alteration to the D DNA maybe. But, but, you know, we think the DNA sequence is fundamentally being fixed, but but chromatin, the epigenome, is 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 not like that. Okay, it's much more um, plastic and, and and dynamic. Okay, so so what I mean by by chromatin and, and I, I use chromatin and epigenome interchangeably. A lot of people don't like that, but I don't I don't think we need to make the distinction here. What I mean by chromatin in the epigenome is is the way that the, the DNA is is folded up inside the nucleus, okay? So you have the strand of DNA, it's wrapped around proteins to form these so-called nucleosomes. Um, those, those nucleosomes can be modified on the DNA. Um, for example, the, the DNA methylation that, that Morgan studies. I, I saw your, your, your wonderful interview with, with Morgan. Um, so the DNA methylation, there's also you know, modifications of the histones 
And then all this is, again, further folded and ultimately compacted into the nucleus, okay? And it's this, this really complex mixture that, that makes up chromatin or the epigenome. As I say, that's not completely fixed, okay? Because every time a gene is converted into, into RNA to, you know, to, 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 to express that, that gene to make, ultimately make that protein, you know, that, that gene has to be unfolded. We also know that, that DNA replication leads to unfolding and then refolding of the chromatin. Um, DNA repair involve, involves unfolding and refolding. So basically everything that happens to chromatin involves, you know, this kind of unfolding and refolding. Okay, mm -hmm. so in other words, then chromatin is very plastic, okay? It's opening, it's breathing all the time. And so, so therefore we think that, you know, chromatin is not, is, is more in this kind of steady state, okay? It, it, it more of a, there's, it requires a certain level of homeostasis, okay? So that's where chromostasis comes from. It's basically chromatin homeostasis, okay? And that's actually borrowing from another expression in the, the aging field, proteostasis, okay? Which basically means the same thing, which is kind of, you know, protein homeostasis, okay? Keeping proteins in the, you know, which are, you know, kind of dynamic and plastic, keeping them what, kind of where they're meant to be. Um, and so because it's dynamic and plastic, you know, we think that therefore it's, it's prone to change over time. Okay, and actually, you know, the DNA methylation clock is a perfect example of that. Okay, so the, the clock obviously ticks with age, you know, through the gain and loss of these DNA methylations. And, and that, you know, that, that loss, that gain and loss of methylation, that ticking of the clock is, is a, you know, an example is an example of this change with age, which, you know, is predicted from the fact that, that chromatin is not completely fixed. Um, you know, I guess, so then we take it one step further and we reason that, well, if chromatin is changing with age, ultimately that's going to impact on, you know, cell phenotype and function. Okay. Mm -hmm. Because what, you know, what really defines cells, okay. What, what makes a neuron different from a, from a cardiomyocyte, a heart cell, it, I mean, their, their DNA sequence is, is essentially identical, but what makes those two cells this, different is that is their chromatin okay right. the way that the, the way the dna is is packaged up so so if if this chromatin is so important for cell identity and yet it's changing with age then at some point that's you know that has the potential to change cell phenotype okay and that would be a really bad thing okay and so you know the ultimate example of this i think is you know neurons and cardiomyocytes okay so many of the neurons in our brains i mean they're with us for the whole of our lives Okay, 80 or 90 years. So, you know, in my mind, you know, really kind of important question is, you know, how does a neuron remain as a neuron for 90 years? Okay, I think that's really amazing. Um, and so yes, that's the neurons, the neurons, the neurons in the brain, they don't really change. No, so, so the, the, there are, I mean, there are stem cells in the brain. So there is some, there is some turnover. Of, of cells in the brain, but it's it's very slow. It doesn't, as I understand it, it doesn't affect all populations of cells in the brain. And when people have done, I mean, people have done these kind of, um, you know, kind of radioisotope um, label. I mean, this is, I think it's been linked to, for example, new, I'm not sure whether it's linked to. Well, I can't remember. I, I won't. I won't attempt to say how it's been done, but. But the study's been done trying to age neurons in the brain, okay, and, and, it's, and it's being concluded that a, a significant proportion of the neurons in our brains are, you know, we, we are born with those neurons, okay? So those neurons are with us for our entire lives. And yet, you know, and, and I think the same is true of probably of cardiomyocytes. For other tissues which are turning over more quickly, it's not true, okay? I mean, um, but for, for these long-lived very slowly dividing tissues, these cells live for a very long time. So, you know, if, if these neurons have this dynamic chromatin, which is, you know, turning over and, and breathing and opening and closing, well, you know, how does that neuron stay as a neuron for, for 90 years? Okay, I, I don't think we know the answer to that question. So, so the, the whole chromostasis idea is really meant to be just a way of kind of conceptualizing that. How does, what are the mechanisms by which a cell stabilizes its chromatin 
or its epigenome so as to be able to maintain its phenotype. Okay, and another way of putting it is, you know, how does a cell perhaps slow down the clicking, of the ticking of the clock? Mm-hmm. Okay, I mean, Morgan talked about how top the, the clock can tick, you know, faster, and that might lead to an increase in biological age, and that can be detrimental. Um, but, you know, so, so to what extent can the cell control that rate of ticking and therefore, you know, prevent it ticking so fast that, you know, that the function deteriorates, if, you know, too early. And, you know, um, I would imagine, for example, that, I mean, I, you know, that this, that the, these mechanisms are, for example, more efficient in long-lived human cells than in mouse cells. Okay, so, you know, mouse cells only live for a couple of years, but mm-hmm. you know, human neurons can live for 90 years. So, so these mechanisms are probably you know, more sophisticated, you know, more efficient in, in human cells. But, but anyway, by, by chromostasis, we're trying to understand what those mechanisms are. I see. So have we identified any of these mechanisms? Because I know you've talked about some of these epigenetic regulators, one of them being um, HERA, I believe. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah, so, so that, I mean, that was, it was some studies that we did with this, this histone, chaperone her a in in senescent cells which kind of you know um led to this idea because what we found was that in, in senescent cells that this this her a chaperone is, is leading to you know kind of turnover of uh, was controlling the turnover of nucleosomes um the, the histones which make up the nucleosomes so so we reasoned that you know her a was likely to in, impact on on this process um, but I wouldn't say yet we have any, I mean, there is some evidence, not from, not from us, but there is some evidence that if you inactivate her A, for example, in, in the muscle, okay, the, mu- the muscle is another, um, you know, is again, made up of long lived, slowly dividing cells, the, the these, my, um, myocytes and myotubes, okay, muscle turns over very slowly so those cells are also very long lived and there is evidence that if you inactivate her a in in the muscle then that does lead to kind of you know it leads to a a kind of failure of lineage maintenance okay so by that view yes her a is working in you know to in in to promote chromostasis in in the muscle i would say that would be one way of of um interpreting those data interesting what about are there any other mechanisms um no i mean it's it's um i mean you know i mean i I would speculate for example that you know that mechanisms involved in um you know regulating DNA methylation and, and the DNA methylation clock are also, uh, you know, in, involved in this. But, mm-hmm. you know, I, I guess the, the experiments, so the experiments that need to be done to really, you know, confirm this would, are to, you know, to inactivate the, you know, the, the candidate genes of, of interest, okay, for example, in, in a mouse, and show that the inactivating that gene leads to a a degeneration of 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 the chromatin with age and and also a you know degeneration and phenotype and and function of the cells and so you know there aren't there aren't that many studies um describing that that kind of thing as i say her a is you know fits into that that category but i'm having trouble thinking of anything else at, at the moment um you know yeah. again the, you know these are these are really you know basically what you have to do is you you know you have to in, inactivate your gene of interest which has no you know the prediction is it, it has no it has no consequence in a in a in a young mouse okay and then you have to age that mouse for for a couple of years in anticipation of getting a phenotype okay and so we are doing some of those studies but it's early days but you can understand why 
you know, people don't necessarily do that kind of thing. If you inactivate a gene in a young mouse and it has no phenotype, well, you might not go much further with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Um, last few questions. And I'm curious, what even got you interested in studying cancer and aging in the first place? Ah, okay. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I mean, I was trained in, in cancer. Um, so I did, um, I've always, I always worked in cancer centers. I did my PhD at what was the, the Imperial Cancer Research Fund in London, now Cancer Research UK. I then went to Dana-Farber Cancer Institute in Boston. I worked with, uh, with, with Bill Kalin, who subsequently went to get, went, went on to get a, a, a Nobel prize for, you know, for oxygen sensing. I mean, he, he was looking at this specifically in the context of, of, of kidney cancer. I, I didn't work, I should say, I didn't work on any of that. I was working on different things, but it was, you know, really, I guess, you know, really exciting time to, to witness mm -hmm. that stuff. And I'm really happy for, for Bill to have, to have got that. Um, but anyway, so I went, I worked with Bill Kalin at the Dana-Farber. I then had my own lab at Fox Chase Cancer Center in Philadelphia. And that was when I kind of got, I actually got drawn into cell senescence. So we were actually working on the HER-A chaperone and that drew us into cellular senescence. Um, and then, you know, the, the interesting thing about senescence is that, you know, as, as I said at the beginning, okay, senescence both prevents cancer, but promotes aging. Okay. So that kind of got me thinking about, you know, both, both sides of it. Um, I wrote a grant on senescence and, um, and I sent it to a, you know, an NIH study section, which was primarily an aging study section and the grant got funded. And then as they do, they then, you know, ask you to come and, you know, come onto that study section and review, review grants that, that tends to happen. So that, that was my first real kind of exposure to, you know, the biology of aging back mm -hmm. in the 1990s and you know to start with i thought wow this is you know really kind of crazy stuff okay because the thing about aging is that it's you know it's so complex it affects it affects everything and you know so you get you get exposed to all different types of biology of different cells of different tissues and different organisms i mean the, the breadth of it is just huge so you know first time you start thinking about it it's just kind of overwhelming um but then eventually you know when i started kind of getting to grips with it you come to appreciate that because you know just the complexities of it and the breadth of it and the fact that it's always connected to biology okay i mean sometimes for example if you work on epigenetics sometimes you find yourself studying you know modification of a histone okay but well okay great but what's that got to do what's that really got to do with biology but the thing about aging is because it's fundamentally a biological process, okay, you know, everything always comes back to the biology. So if you like biology, I think, you know, aging is the, just the best thing because it's always connected to the biology and it, and, it, and it encompasses, you know, every different type of, of, of biology. Okay, so I really enjoy that. So yeah, it just kind of just kind of sucked me into it. And, and over the years, I've got more and more interested in the biology of aging. But because I guess because I've always been you know, work because I was trained in cancer and always working in cancer centers. I then, you know, got thinking about this. Well, you know, why does the incidence of cancer increase with age? Okay, I read a couple of very, you know, influential, very influential to me anyway, uh, articles by uh, James de Gregory and uh, Ja Pedro de Magales. Um, they were previously thinking about the re relationship between aging and cancer. So that kind of got me thinking about it more. And I realized that, you know, we really don't understand why the incidence of cancer increases with age. Okay. I mean, the, the view in the cancer field is often, uh, um, well, you know, cancer increases with age just because, you know, mutations accumulate with age and it takes time to, to accumulate the number of mutations that you need to get cancer. And, and I think that's part of it. But, you know, when you look at it from a kind of hallmarks of aging perspective, you also realize, well, that's, you know, that's way too simple, okay? Because, you know, DNA mutations is only one of the hallmarks of aging, yeah? I mean, there's, there's many of these hallmarks. So, and we know that most of these hallmarks, well, obviously all these hallmarks are changing with age. And we know that many of them can probably contribute to cancer. So I think it's reasonable to propose that, that it's actually all of the hallmarks which are contributing to the increased incidence of of cancer with age and you know so that's what we're trying to get at with the, the grant that i mentioned on liver cancer okay we're trying to take a broad 
view and let's look of lots of different things with collaborators at you know Salk Institute and, and UCSD. That's fantastic, That's fantastic that you combine your two and two. So yeah, 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 I, yeah. I mean, it takes a long time. I find, I, I, for me anyway, it took a long time in biology to kind of get something which really kind of, you know, gets you excited and that you're really passionate about. But yeah, biology of aging and, you know, the relationship between aging and cancer is just really, really fascinating, I think. Right. So many open questions. To yeah, explore. yeah, yeah, yeah. Amazing. So last question. Um, anything else on just cell senescence, cancer, aging that we haven't covered you think you want to talk about? Um, couple, just a couple of areas. Uh, I mean, something that we're, we, we're getting very interested in the relationship between development and, and aging. Okay, so typically we think of development and aging as being two separate processes okay you know when development stops as a young adult that's kind of when aging starts um i i think we, we're starting to think of those as, as perhaps being more connected and i know others are too vadim vadim gladyshev for example at, at harvard the reason we think this and actually I, I won't go into it in detail but it came out of some studies that we were doing with with the her a chaperone but it got us thinking that you know, when you think about aging, and for example, you know, aging of stem cells, for example, those mm -hmm. stem cells which are aging and leading to decline of, of a tissue, I mean, those stem cells were actually generated during development, okay, in humans, in, you know, in utero, okay, so there is a connection between development in utero and, and aging, okay, mm -hmm. and what happens in utero and during early development, I mean, that is really the foundation for, for what happened, for the aging that, you know, that, that's the foundation on which, you know, aging in light, later life happens, okay? So, so we're, we're trying, kind of exploring that connection. To what extent does the integrity of, you know, early development in utero, um, to what extent does that influence late life aging? Is, is this connected at all to the hyperfunction or the programmatic theory that David Gems or Joe Pedro talk about? Um, yeah, possibly. And I, you know, I listened to the, um, I mean, I don't, I don't think it has to be. Okay. I mean, I, I think it kind of, it does obviously kind of beg those kinds of, uh, connections. Um, but I don't think, you know, I don't think, it, I don't think it's necessary. I mean, I, I think regardless of, you know, whether you, you know, agree or disagree with the hyperfunction theory, Okay, um, you know, I, I think it's still true that, you know, what happens in aging is happening on a foundation that was built during development. Hmm. Okay, so I think therefore, you know, what happens in development should influence what happens in, in aging. Um, but I, you know, that's not as good, that's not, ne that, I don't think that's, that's not a, a restatement of the of the hyperfunction theory and it's not going as far as the hyperfunction theory and I actually thought that I think I misunderstood the hyperfunction theory a bit I actually think that what you know kind of what how David described the hyperfunction theory as being a you know kind of a I mean it's, it's not a program as in you know aging is programmed but it's a, a program as in you know it, it's 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 something that that happens just because of the way the biological system is is set up okay i mean we've thought about some histone you know changes in chromatin you know some changes in chromatin with age we think are happening to, you know the way they do simply because you know this is the way they start okay the way it starts is you know influences kind of what happens in later life mm -hmm. and you know so by that view i mean there is a bit of a program there yeah i mean it's, it's programmed to start with, so that pro that that program is going to initiate, kind of influence what happens later. So, I don't know. That's probably not really the hyperfunction theory. When you say the way it starts, then then would it be very connected to someone's genes, just like the genetics they get from their ancestors, or is there something that's happening super early on in life, even in just development stage, or maybe? when the child is in the womb itself uh, that you think is affecting how people age later? 
Yeah, so, so there is evidence, for example, that, you know, in utero influences, you know, for example, through, mm -hmm. through diet um, yeah. can influence yeah. late life aging. I mean, the, the so-called Dutch hunger, hunger winter, okay, when there was a famine at the end of the Second World War in the Netherlands and, and you know, uh, people who were in utero at the time of that famine, you know, 70 years later, there are increased risk of metabolic disease and, and obesity. Okay, so that's an example of how I think in utero programming, perhaps epigenetic programming, you know, in utero can influence um, late life aging. So that's, that's the kind of mechanism that, that we're thinking about, okay, which is exciting because it does, you know, it does then lead to the idea that, well, you know, you could have, you know, um, nu nutritional supplements, dietary supplements during, you know, during pregnancy to, to you know, promote Help you know healthy development in in a way that you know leads to you know healthy aging seventy years later. Okay, right. that's quite a, quite an intriguing idea, I think. Yeah, yeah, it puts a lot more pressure on the mother. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 yeah, right. You're, you're the first person that's picked me up on that. I always, I always hesitate to, to say that because it, it it obviously does. Um, but you know, I guess. Uh, you know, I'm just kind of, again. I guess I'm just re reasoning through the science and not not trying to think of the, the no, kind of absolutely. Science. I mean, I think as long as we yeah. understand the right. explanations in science, and it's it's better for everyone, right, to just know what's actually happening. Then right, right. And I'll actually be talking to uh, Dr. Vadim in like a few weeks as well. Oh, so great! Yeah, okay. so I'm excited to talk yeah. about this then. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, just the other thing, I just want to say one other thing, which is kind of getting me excited which mm -hmm. and i think it's going to be a challenge for the field is um you know heterogeneity associated with aging okay so there's a number of papers out there now showing that you know as tissues age they become you know more heterogeneous okay the cells become you know more kind of divergent i think the first person to show this was 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 jan vick uh, albert einstein quite a long time ago he showed that cardiomyocytes in the heart you know in a young mouse they're very similar but in an old mouse, they become more divergent. Okay, so you get this heterogeneity with age. And, and with some of the technologies that we have now, that's becoming, you know, there's more and more studies are showing that. And so I think the, the implications of that for healthy aging, for aging are, are really quite profound. Okay, I mean, how does that, how does that impact aging of a tissue? And, and experimentally, how, how do we investigate that? Okay, how, how do we... Kind of manipulate that heterogeneity and try and understand whether it's a, a good thing or a or a bad thing. I, I don't know. It's going to be a challenge, I think. But it's a kind of an interesting problem to think about. Is there any research on that linking that with aging? No, and and I mean, there's there's not that I know of. There's there's now there's now many studies showing that with age, that you know, the transcriptome and the epigenome become more variable with age. Okay, I think Vadim has, has done some of that. Okay, so cells become more variable. But actually showing that, you know, understanding how, if it does, that actually contributes to tissue aging and, and decline in function, I, I, I don't know of anything. And as I say, I think it's, a, it's a kind of a difficult problem to address. But an interesting one to think about. Definitely. All right. Well, fascinating. Thank you so much for your time today. I'm looking forward to some of the, the more uh, more research coming out, some of the more open questions you're exploring. Yeah. Thanks, Asta. Really, really nice talking to you. And you it, as well. Yeah. Keep up right. the good work. Thank you. Thank yeah. you so much. I Thank appreciate you. it. Bye. Hey, everyone. I hope you enjoyed the episode. I'm blown away by the pace of longevity research, and I want to keep bringing you great conversations with longevity scientists themselves. If you want to support all my effort and time that goes into the creation of this information to boost longevity, all resources can be found at livelongerworld.com. As you all know, aging is universal and we can unite in this fight and soon be healthy forever. I can't wait and see you next time.